Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, for the for a live stream uh, for the History Valley podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Conrad Schmid, and he is a professor at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, and he has written some books on the Old Testament. And one of them that we're going to be talking about today is Genesis and the Moses story. I have the link uh, to it and, and the rest of the information in the description. Welcome to History Valley podcast, Professor Schmid. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And here's the book uh, once again. And there's a couple of links right there on the right where you may purchase the book. I highly recommend it. Okay, let's proceed with the next slide. In the book, uh, 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 Dr. Schmid, you, you talk about the documentary hypothesis, your views of it. And I know that your views are very similar, but also a bit different. Um, could you explain to the audience how you look at the documentary hypothesis? Uh, yes, thank you. The documentary hypothesis is a very successful theory in order to explain the composition of the Pentateuch. Its usual shape or form was formulated in the late 19th century by scholars like Julius Wellhausen, and I think it's fair to say that the documentary hypothesis up until the 1970s and 80s of the last century was the predominant way to explain the composition of the Pentateuch. The idea is quite simple. The documentary hypothesis, hypothesis says that the Pentateuch is composed out of three little small proto pentateuchs uh, pentateuchs and uh, the, these three strains are called j e and p and they basically recount the same story from creation to ancestors exodus story wandering in the wilderness up until the conquest of the land and these three sources have been subsequently combined so this was so to speak the status of scholarship uh, up until the end of the last century but i think particularly in european continental scholarship at the end of the last century uh, there were quite some doubts that arose regarding that theory because if you read the pentateuch your main impression is not that there are three uh, similar strands that run all through it, but the main impression that was already made by scholars like Martin Note early on is that every block of the Pentateuch actually has a certain autonomy. So the, the primeval history, the story about the ancestors, the Exodus story, these parts of the Pentateuch actually work very well as narratives unto themselves. And therefore, uh, my book, uh, along with other others, argue, uh, argues that the Pentateuch mainly was uh, written or redacted out of major units, the primeval history, the ancestor story, and uh, the exodus story, and that the narrative thread that goes all through is actually a relatively late achievement of the tradition history of the Pentateuch. But I still would highlight that my position is also a documentary hypo uh, hypothesis it just doesn't reckon with uh, three sources that are very similar i think there is one late sources p the priestly code that for the first time probably in the late babylonian or early persian period really combines all the topics whereas beforehand the literary units that were included in the Pent into the pentateuch uh, were limited to this major topics, the primeval history, the ancestor story, and the exodus story. So you think that there were fewer sources than the documentary hypothesis usually suspects are there? Uh, 
that's difficult to say in terms of numbers because, uh, of course, the documentary hypothesis also uh, basically says there are three or four sources, J, E, D, P, but uh, the classic writers and scholars in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century, of course, also assumed that uh, J and E particularly, but maybe also P, that they also included source material, earlier source material that uh, then was combined into these sources. So just to give a quick example, uh, J, for example, also includes an earlier Jacob cycle, which probably once was a literary unity unto its own. I, th I, I would say if I simplify my position, then I would say I also reckon with four sources, but I don't have JEDP or say five sources, but I have the primeval history, I have the ancestors history, I have the Moses Exodus story, I have D, the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, and I have P. So this would be uh, the most simple way to put it in terms of numbers. But of course, every uh, single one of these literary units that once was uh, a literary entity unto itself has also a literary, a literary and probably also an, an oral prehistory. I know you talk about in the book um, that you put a level of redaction in Genesis and I think Exodus as well, and you were just saying it earlier, into the Persian period or so, somewhere around there. Um, what led you to that conclusion? Yes, uh, I think that the texts in Genesis that link Genesis with Exodus and the other way around, the texts in Exodus that link Exodus with Genesis and consider Genesis as the introduction of uh, exodus are really quite late and uh, the observations or the reasons that led me to this assumptions uh, are uh, the following if you read or try to read genesis and exodus as a continuous story then you actually uh, have quite some problems in understanding it so on the surface it it is possible. It's possible, but uh, if you have a closer look, several problems arise. So, first of all, uh, the chronology. Uh, how is the chronology in the Bible presented from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph to Moses and so on? If you read the Moses story or the beginning of the Moses story in Exodus 2, then you can see that Moses is a grandkid of Levi, who is a son of Jacob. But if you read a little bit later on uh, in Exodus, then you can see uh, that in Exodus 12, we are told that Israel uh, served 400 years in Egypt as slaves. And this also seems to be the idea or the notion behind Exodus 1. Uh, at the beginning of the book of Exodus, uh, the tribe of Jacob comes to uh, or arrives in Egypt. And uh, only nine verses later in Exodus 1, 9, uh, this tribe of Jacob that counts 70 people is all of a sudden a big people of which uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians are afraid. So this cannot really uh, be a harmonious transition uh, of one story uh, that covers both Genesis and Exodus. A second observation uh, can be found uh, in the depiction of Israel and Egypt at the end of Genesis on the one hand and at the beginning of Exodus on the other hand. At the end of Exodus, uh, uh, Genesis in the Joseph story, you can see that Pharaoh is depicted as a wise ruler who treats Israel very well. The Israelites are uh, nomads. They are, yeah, they are peasants. They uh, 
move uh, from uh, one place to another. Whether, whereas at the beginning of Exodus, you have a completely different picture. Pharaoh is a Pharaoh is a tyrant, a really uh, evil ruler, uh, very violent, and the Israelites are depicted as something like prisoners of war that have to do corvée labor. And this is also not explained. So I think uh, <laughs> even uh, somehow uh, the Bible itself apparently felt that this is not a smooth transition and therefore you can read in Exodus 1, 6 to 8 at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And after Joseph died, a new king over uh, Egypt arose uh, who didn't know Joseph. This is completely uh, in, unimaginable that the successor of the pharaoh of Joseph wouldn't know who the second man in Egypt, Joseph, would have been. The only explanation is that here apparently two formerly independent uh, literary tradition blocks have been combined and uh, this explanation that this new king didn't know Joseph is simply an explanation, a very difficult and not very plausible, but uh, yeah, it's somehow uh, within the shortest uh, space that uh, the narrative allows. It explains uh, why there is no memory of uh, Joseph and why the Israelites are being treated so badly. So uh, these kinds of observations led me to the fact that uh, somehow the combination or the, uh, the narrative continuity between ancestor Genesis and Moses, Exodus on the other hand, that this is not an original one, but that this uh, aroused probably quite late. And the third element maybe that I could adduce is the completely different uh, theological outlook of Genesis on the one hand and Exodus on the other hand. Genesis is a very inclusive textual body. So the Israelites, they make covenants uh, with the inhabitants of the land. There, are, there, are, there is no violence between the Israelites and the inhabitants of the land, whereas uh, the Exodus story is much more uh, exclusively uh, structured. So the Israelites are being told, uh, once you get into the land, don't make peace with the inhabitants there. And God is a jealous God who... Uh, yeah, who who looks after uh, his uh, his exclusive veneration. So this uh, different profiles, these different profiles between Genesis and Exodus, also, to my mind, quite clearly point uh, to the assumption that these tradition blocks uh, were uh, formally independent one from another. And that only on the level of P, the so-called priestly code, uh, these texts have been combined in the Persian period. And for a, a variety of reasons, we can date P either to the late uh, uh, Babylonian or the early Persian period. Is it is it possible that the the text? That the redactional layer that was written during the Persian period had anything to do with Ezra, because there's a tradition in the Tanakh and the Old Testament that Ezra brought some version of the Torah to the Persian king, or one of the Artaxerxes, or something right. like that. Right. What do you think of that? Of course, we cannot exclude this. I think it somehow, in terms of the time period, this would fit. But uh, I think from a scholarly point of view, uh, we simply have to maintain the Torah, the Pentateuch, is uh, an anonymous uh, piece of literature. It never uh, reveals its authorship. Uh, or uh, the name of the compiler of these different uh, pieces. This is something which is not very astonishing within the ancient Near East because uh, 
literature usually was seen or conceived as traditional literature and not as authorial uh, literature. So uh, whether or I, I don't know whether uh, it uh, is meaningful to assume that uh, Ezra was the one who uh, compiled the Torah. I know that this is a, uh, a theory that is often advanced or people assume this, uh, but I think in terms of what we know, uh, we simply have to say, uh, yeah, it, it might fit in terms of the profession of Ezra. He was a scribe. It might fit in terms of the period, the Persian uh, period, but we have no indication uh, that uh, or evidence from the book of Ezra or so uh, that he compiled the Torah. It simply says he brought the Torah uh, to uh, Judah and uh, there it was read. But it's not, it's not said that he somehow uh, beforehand composed it or so. I think uh, the milieu, the scribal elite that produced the Torah this was probably a small circle at the Second Temple in Jerusalem, but unfortunately we uh, neither have archaeological nor textual evidence how to closer describe these uh, scribal uh, circles. We simply have to uh, yeah, make assumptions from analogies that we know from elsewhere in the ancient Near East. This uh, diagram is based on a diagram in your in your book. Um, you, you show the ancestor story and the Moses Exodus story. And uh, how is it that on Genesis 15, it's an ancestor and the one on the right seems to be coming from a different tradition? Right. Uh, this is a very interesting problem within the Torah. Uh, where is actually God identified as Adonai? The, the, the identity of the biblical God as Adonai is uh, rooted uh, in the most deepest way in the Exodus tradition, whereas in the Genesis tradition, of course, there are uh, some occurrences where God introduces himself as I am Adonai, for example, in Genesis 15, the, uh, the verse that you are displaying on the slide, or in Genesis 28, 13, would be another. Uh, I think one can assume that maybe um, behind the ancestor stories there are traditions of... Uh, deities that were relevant in the history in the geographical realm of uh, ancient Israel and Judah that were not yet necessarily identified with Adonai so we have also these different wordings as pachat uh, Yitzchak uh, or magin Abraham uh, designations of God uh, that apparently mm, try to circumvent uh, the specific name of, uh, of God. Uh, in the Moses Exodus story, and here I would say Exodus 3, 6 probably is really also a very late text that belongs to this layer, redactional layer that combined Genesis and Exodus. Exodus 3, 6 is certainly uh, 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 a text that wants to stress the god Adonai who is so prominent in the Exodus story is no other than the god of Abraham uh, Jacob and Isaac and uh, it's uh, if you read uh, Exodus 3 attentively you can see that the text somehow struggles with this uh, problem that Moses, on the one hand, uh, 
seems to reckon with the fact that the people actually does not know who their God is. So Moses asks God, and, and, and what shall I uh, say? Who, who appeared to me? And then God has to explain in Exodus uh, 3, 14 and 15 who he is. And this seems to point uh, to the fact that in the Moses Exodus story, uh, the identity of uh, this God who leads Israel out of Egypt with the God of the ancestors is something which does not belong to the yet yeah, to the very basic layer of the story. This is something that only came about and is being argued by texts like Exodus uh, 3 6 that became necessary once Genesis became the introduction, the literary introduction to the Moses Exodus story. What do you make of what's happening in Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 to 9? A lot of scholars talk about this, and um, there seems to be it seems to be that the text has been changed over time. Like in the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls version of it is more similar to the Septuagint than what's in the middle of the Masoretic text, the modern version of Deuteronomy 42 verses 8 to 9. And the law scholars will say that this is an indicator of an of a tradition that's that that, kind of, that partially survived in Deuteronomy that uh Yahweh, that Yahweh or Adonai inherited Israel as a piece of land from a higher, more supreme deity. And that redaction has kind of tried to combine the two deities together. Right. This is a very famous text in the discussion, in the discussion about the rise of monotheism in ancient Israel. And indeed, I think that probably the version that is preserved by the Dead Sea Scrolls, a small fragment, and also by the Septuagint, is probably more original than uh, what we read in the Masoretic text. And the reason is simply the Masoretic text is, uh, <laughs> is a little less polytheistic, and it seems to iron out the theological problems that we have in the version of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Indeed, here the idea seems to be when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he separated humankind, he set the bounds of people according to the number of the children or the sons of God. So uh, specific... Uh, 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 specific deities for the lords. So uh, here, uh, actually, the the tetragrammaton Adonai is given. Uh, uh, Adonai's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Some people say, yeah, this is a window into the polytheistic past of ancient Israel. There is, so to speak, a high remote deity called El or Eliom which translates into the Most High. And uh, this uh, remote high deity is, so to speak, the chief in the, the chief deity in a large pantheon. And every nation has its individual god. And Israel, Jacob, of course, has Adonai as uh, its god. Or, uh, and... Uh, this would be uh, actually indeed a nice assumption to think uh, of this text as reflecting this system that we know well from the history of religions in the ancient Near East. If you travel from one country to the next, then of course also the system of deities changes uh, Adonai is only in charge in Israel and Judah and uh, if you would uh, move to Moab then uh, uh, Kemosh would be the supreme deity if you move to Egypt then you would have Ra or Atom or other deities that would be in charge I personally however uh, am not uh, super sure whether this is really a very old text I think if we look in the Bible where we really have uh, this explicit idea, every 
uh, nation has its own counterpart in the heavenly realm, uh, then uh, the most uh, or the closest parallels are actually in the book of Daniel, Daniel 10, where different angels are in charge of the different nations. So it could well be that Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9 uh, even in the version of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint, which is a bit more, seems to be more original than the Masoretic says, that even these texts are actually not uh, very early texts, but rather late, uh, uh, a late text, say from the fourth or the third uh, century, but it plays with polytheistic language. Of course, somehow even... Uh, once monotheism in ancient Israel and Judah became prevalent, uh, there still were memories about the polytheistic past of Israel. And this seems to be the linguistic register uh, with which this text in Deuteronomy 32 plays. What's uh, what is the hypertextual, uh, hexatical portrait of history? Genesis fifteen, Exodus three to four, Joshua twenty four. Yes. So this these texts that you uh, uh, display here, these would be the elements that I would count among uh, the the elements of this maybe early Persian period redactional layer that for the first time combined. Genesis on the one hand, and Moses and the Exodus story uh, on the other hand. And here you can uh, ask yourself, what happens if you combine a self-standing Genesis with a self-standing Moses Exodus uh, story? And I think it's quite clear. If you look at uh, the book of Genesis, there you have this set of texts uh, that are usually known as the promises to the patriarchs. And these promises of the patriarchs, they uh, promise the patriarchs to become uh, uh, strong and big people uh, and that they will in or, or that they will inherit the land. And, and if you read these promises, you don't have the impression that they were formulated with the expectation that first, before these promises come true, that Israel has to emigrate into Egypt, serve there for 400, uh, 400 years, then uh, uh, wander through the wilderness, and only then the third or third, uh, the second or the third generation would arrive in the land. But if you now combine Genesis and the Moses story, then uh, somehow uh, the Moses Exodus story that has its natural end in the in these narratives about the conquest of the land, then uh, the Joshua texts become, so to speak, uh, the fulfillment texts of the of these uh, promises in Genesis. So. Here, what here uh, emerges is this picture that we know from the Bible very well, from the Torah, from the Pentateuch, and also the Hexateuch, if we include the book of Joshua, that uh, the promises are not no longer open promises as uh, they are if you just read the book of Genesis as an entity unto itself, but uh, they have a narrative fulfillment in the conquest traditions of the book of Joshua. And therefore, this idea of a salvation history from the ancestors to the conquest of the land arises, and the conquest of the land is, so to speak, the climax, the culmination point of the sequence of the narrative books of the Hebrew Bible. And after Joshua, in, after in Joshua, somehow this storyline uh, reaches its climax. Then in the books of uh, Judges, Samuel and Kings, uh, this narrative thread now declines. And after the conquest of the land, we have a long story that explains how Israel eventually lost this promised land again. <laughs> 
When would you date the book of Joshua? The book of Joshua, like uh, most books of the Hebrew Bible, has a complex and a long history of composition. I think the kernel of the book of Joshua probably uh, or can be found in, uh, in the chapters 2 to 12. And if you would uh, put tiny little flags onto a map of Israel, then you would uh, quickly see that most of the traditions of uh, Judges 2 to 12 either belong to the, sorry, to the, to the north, either belong to the north or particularly also to the tribe of Benjamin. And this uh, reflects uh, in all probability the genesis of the book of Joshua. These are local traditions that may uh, well go back into the monarchic period, but there are also uh, parts of the book of Joshua which are quite late, particularly uh, chapters 13 to 21 uh, that presuppose the priestly code, or Joshua 24 is a is a very late text that uh, clearly reflects the the combination of Genesis and Exodus. What about Leviticus and Numbers? Where would you place uh, those two? Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, a contested issue. If you uh, go according to the documentary hypothesis, then uh, you can see that. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm disturbed here again. That's okay. Sorry, uh, Leviticus and Numbers uh, are texts that mostly are assigned to P or uh, literary expansions to P and uh, therefore uh, these are uh, considered not very early texts and within the, the framework of the documentary hypothesis particularly in numbers uh, people either or scholars identified certain parts that might belong to J and E, but I think in current continental European scholarship, uh, Leviticus and Numbers are usually assigned to uh, elaborations, further elaborations of P, and particularly there's a specific the difference between Leviticus and Numbers. Leviticus uh, plays out on the or depicts uh, the law giving on Mount Sinai, whereas Numbers uh, describes the laws or offers, presents the laws from the desert of Sinai. And I think it's an attractive assumption to say in Numbers, uh, there were those laws included that uh, didn't make it up to Mount Sinai. These are further elaborations of laws. These are laws that are closing gaps uh, from that were being left open from, uh, from uh, the book of Leviticus. And uh, therefore, I think uh, particularly Numbers is a container of laws uh, that uh, yeah, uh, originated in a period where it was no longer possible to include them to the uh, laws that really belong to the Mount of Sinai. And, and therefore, they are now located in the desert of Sinai. We have a super chat question. Graham Pong, thank you for the super chat. Date and location of Diderot offer D. Yeah, this is, a, uh, this is, one of the anchors of Pentateuchal studies uh, and also a uh, quite an old uh, assumption. In 1805, uh, Wilhelm Martin Leberecht de Wette uh, 
uh, published his dissertation about D, the historical uh, location of D, and uh, uh, he made a very simple observation. He saw that in Second Kings 23, the king uh, or King Josiah of Judah performs a reform that basically aligns with what D or Deuteronomy uh, claims what uh, should be a correct cult. Namely, that the cult needs to be centralized in Jerusalem and that only Adonai can be venerated in this uh, cult. And therefore, uh, Wilhelm Martin Leberecht de Wette claimed that the book of Deuteronomy originated in the period of King Josiah, that is about 620 BCE. Nowadays, uh, one is a little less sure uh, whether uh, this argument with Second Kings 20 through, uh, 23 uh, really holds water, basically because Second uh, Kings 22, uh, 3 is also text that is, uh, yeah, has been redactionally expanded. But nevertheless, the majority of the scholars uh, still think that uh, Deuteronomy belongs to the end of the 7th century BC, basically because Deuteronomy is a subversive reception and adaptation of Neo-Assyrian vassal treaties that were known in the 7th century. The Neo-Assyrian great kings, they claimed that uh, they claimed uh, or uh, they, uh, they uh, pressed the, the subdued nations to uh, to swear complete uh, loyalty to the Assyrian uh, great king. And apparently Deuteronomy took up this template of the new Assyrian vassal treaties, but uh, reconceptualized it, this repurposed this towards the relationship of Israel to Adonai. And so the authors of Deuteronomy said, uh, yes, we are loyal, but we are not loyal uh, to the Syrian great king, but to our uh, God alone. And this subversive reception of new Assyrian vassal treaties also points to a period in uh, the history of the Syrian empire where the Assyrians already got somehow uh, somewhat weak. So, and this would also point to the end of the 7th century BC. Look at the next slide. <clears throat> at uh, the final pages of your book, you talk about Hecatias, Manifu, Lysimachus of Alexandria, and Apion, um, each one having a different report about a, a different historical uh, look at, on Moses. What do you think of these sources, and do you think any of them provide any reliable data on Moses? Uh, I think uh, one can clearly negate uh, this question. These extra biblical sources, they are very, very interested, uh, interesting simply uh, in order to see what was known about Moses or the Exodus story in uh, the 4th and the 3rd and the 2nd century, uh, particularly in Hellenistic Egypt. And uh, one can see that uh, despite at this time uh, the Torah was already finished and uh, maybe also was to a certain degree accessible within the Jewish communities as a written text, that if one looks a little bit outside of Judaism into pagan authors and historians, that uh, they somehow had an idea of Moses, they had an idea of the uh, Exodus, uh, but uh, it's really so distant uh, from what we know from the Bible that uh, one can only explain these differences by assuming that apparently uh, there were oral traditions and they somehow reached these ancient historians and they uh, made up their own stories. Within my book, 
these authors play a specific role because I wanted to show that even in late texts, uh, and I also uh, adduce a few late texts from the Bible, that uh, you still can see or you can still feel that Genesis and Exodus is not a smooth uh, or offers not a smooth narrative uh, continuity, but that these receptions from the late Persian or early Hellenistic period still show that apparently the Moses story was being conceived as something, uh, as a narrative entity unto itself. So you don't think that any of these um, later historians talking about Moses are, they're not based, they're basically not any more reliable than we have what we have in the book of Exodus. Yes. So if you ask really about the historicity, then also the book of Exodus, I think uh, the, the historical elements in it are also quite scarce. So, so what we can assume is that Moses was a, historical person, which is goes not uh, simply by itself. But Moses, Moses uh, has an Egyptian name. So Moses is a short form that we also know from Egyptian names like Ramose or Ramses or Tutmose. Uh, so uh, it's just a short form and it means basically child or was born and uh, I think if Moses would have been invented by Persian or Hellenistic Judaism then he certainly wouldn't have born bore, uh, an Egyptian name but he would have been named Ezra or, or Baruch or uh, another common uh, Jewish name. So this is one element that points to the historicity of Moses. The second element is that the Torah in two instances uh, tells us that Moses married a foreign wife. And also this is something that uh, in the Second Temple, Judaism probably would not have been uh, invented. If you read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you can see how sensitive this issue is of marrying uh, non-Jewish women. This is also something that points uh, to the his historicity of Moses. But uh, beyond that, it's very, very difficult to say anything about the historicity of the Exodus account from the Bible. But we can assume uh, there are Egyptian documents that tell us that there were migration uh, streams uh, to and fro uh, the, 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 the Nile Delta to the southern uh, Levant and Probably the Exodus story just combines different wanderings from the Nile Delta, different uh, exoduses, if you uh, wish, exodoi in Greek, uh, into one single event. But if you read uh, Maneto, for example, you can really see this is this is so far away from uh, the Bible. So there we have this idea that Moses uh, collected all the sick e Egyptians, and then he led these six these uh, these leprous uh, people out of Egypt, and he brought uh, them into the land. And he, Moses himself, founded Jerusalem. So uh, it's all tied to the figure of Moses, and this is clearly a secondary adaptation and a secondary mix-up of uh, elements that in the Bible are uh, assigned to different persons of the history of Israel. We have another super chat question. Consolation Pegasus, thank you for your super chat. Does the Hebrew Bible have any sayings on resurrection and life after death before the book of Daniel was written? It's strange how the Pharisees and Sadducees can defer and God let them coexist uh no i think uh, indeed if you read the hebrew bible it's basically daniel 12 you find a little bit uh, of uh, uh, an expectation of uh, resurrection in isaiah 24 to 27 and uh, the famous chapter is ezekiel 37 but this is not about individual resurrection but about the resurrection of the uh, 
people of uh, Israel. So uh, uh, if we look at the Hebrew Bible, the answer is no. It's basically really it's a second century uh, concept that is reflected in Daniel 12. But if we look at the archaeological uh, record, if we uh, ask, what were the burial practices in ancient Israel and Judah? Then you can see from early times on, for example, in Beit Shemesh near Jerusalem, uh, we have some uh, graves that point to this, that early on, apparently, uh, uh, people were buried in communal graves. So three or four persons were being buried together. And they also, they got some weapons or some vessels, pots were being put into the graves. Also, uh, a certain amount of food. And this clearly points to the fact that those people who did this are reckoned uh, with the assumption that these deceased people, uh, that they will live again, that they will resurrect, that they will have a life after death. So I think we can, we can from the archaeological record, say that apparently the, yeah, the, uh, that a life after death was being seen or being deemed as something uh, which was possible. And the Hebrew Bible, this probably also has to do with the rise of monotheism. Uh, the Hebrew Bible is so strongly influenced by this doctrine that God alone is the only divine power that apparently uh, no stories or no clear expectations of a life after death are being included in the, into the traditions that later became biblical because apparently these scribal circles feared that the ancestors uh, would have been uh, venerated as uh, some kind of uh, lower deities and this was not compatible with their idea of exclusive monotheism. Um, uh, when would you date, um, okay, hold on, let me phrase my question. Um, my question was, when do you think monotheism became really, really a big thing in Israel? Yeah, so, uh, here you have to differentiate between the biblical picture and what we can reconstruct uh, from historical records. So the biblical picture clearly says that in the period of Moses, it would be somewhat uh, in the late Bronze Age, around 1200 BCE, that uh, God revealed himself as the only and single uh, God. Uh, so uh, this is clearly the beginning of monotheism according to the biblical presentation. But if we look uh, at the Bible with a critical eye, uh, then we can see that the earliest clear uh, manifestations or the earliest clear biblical verses that express the idea of monotheism belong to the period of the Babylonian exile. Uh, the two most important instances are on the one hand Genesis 1 and on the other hand uh, Isaiah 45. Uh, this belongs to uh, the prophecy of an anonymous prophet of the Babylonian period called usually Deuteroisaiah. So in Genesis 1, we have this idea, God creates heaven and the earth, and it's completely clear that in the first chapter of the Bible, there is only one active deity. This is uh, God himself. So uh, this, is, this is a text that belongs to P, and P is usually dated to the early Persian period. And in Deuteroisaiah, 
we have this saying, I am Adonai, there is no God besides me. And this saying uh, in Isaiah 45, uh, 7 belongs to a context where at the very beginning of that chapter, the Persian great king Cyrus is being named. So also this text uh, belongs to the uh, Persian period. So uh, what we have here regarding monotheism is a, is a feature that we often can uh, see in the Hebrew Bible that certain elements, theological elements that became constitutive for Second Temple uh, Judaism were rejected as originating already in the mythic past in the time of Moses at Mount Sinai uh, in early times. And this influenced and resulted in the biblical presentation of the origin of monotheism. Well, thanks for joining me today, Professor Schmid. I uh, thank everybody that super chatted their questions, and I thank everybody uh, that participated in the live chat. And I will see all of you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.